and thank you to uh, the Darabin City Council for putting on such a great um, you know, a series of webinars and the opportunity to, to, um, to, to do, you know, hold this. Um, the, the way this, this came about and our opportunity to present, uh, I guess really started probably 12 to 18 months ago when as a business, we, as a local, you know, we're based in Northcote and we also have a dispersed workforce and we identified there were certain gaps um, within our business and challenges with that remote workspace um, and just how we connected with with uh, with clients and 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 people and so forth. So we um, engaged George and Rita to to join um, us and work in 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 terms of work with how we could close some of those gaps. And um, by doing that over the last twelve months, it really helped us come COVID back in March, be ready for that. And then when COVID hit, we we started thinking about what can we do to help local businesses and organisations in the area to also, um, you know, whether it be looking at new skills they can implement within their business or just sharing knowledge. So we started running a number of webinars uh, from a Milan Industries perspective um, and George and Rita started holding, holding a number of, um, uh, you know, groups and so forth to, to do the same. And then speaking to the council, um, we really wanted to do something, be proactive and, and do the same to local businesses. and. Um, uh, we were advised that there was this opportunity was coming up, which is excellent. So um, it's allowed us to really, when you look at IT, it's, it's a really broad perspective of how IT can help. And that's, you know, from a business growth perspective, there's people, there's a range of overlaps that, that you'll find. So um, it's just a great opportunity for us to share some of those um you know, look at those areas of, of, of each, per, you know, each business and so forth and, and really focus on how we can connect the workforce. So joining me today, we have Rita Sincotta and George Liberopoulos. Rita um, is the founder of uh, Human Dimensions and George of uh, 2B Consulting and um, really looking forward to being able to, I guess, give our uh, views on what are some of the things that you can do uh, in your business and coming through the, the rest of hopefully not too long a stage four lockdown and really coming out of stage four in a stronger position. So um, I'll give Rita and George the opportunity to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is George Liberopoulos. Um, yeah, real pleasure to be joining uh, this presentation here today. Uh, a little bit about my background. Um, sort of uh, spent my career in um, predominantly HR and also in commercial roles. So what really attracted me to uh, working with Milan Industries was really having that opportunity to, um, you know, being able to influence and assist uh, emerging businesses around the issues of, of growth, um, but having a really strong um, understanding of, you know, the people risk that associated as well with that. Um, I also um, work with um, Mary Outreach Support Service, which is a not-for-profit um, in the city of Derebin, based in High Street, Northcote. Uh, they're a homelessness sector. Um, so for me, in terms of seeing not only uh, local uh, Derebin businesses, um, but also specifically in regards to, you know, in the not-for-profit sector as well, but certainly, um, yeah, we'll be able to provide a perspective across sort of small, medium and, and large enterprises during today's conversation. Perfect, thanks, George. So I think Rita is uh, joining or has joined back. George, uh, thank you for jumping in there. And I think the only thing I'll say um, just in, in addition is at the moment, it is all about connecting people and making sure that we're looking after people from a um, well-being perspective, but also you know, keep, keep businesses moving too. So part of today will also be about productivity um, in addition to keeping the workforce connected. So we'll cover both aspects. Um, and that's probably it in terms of the, the intro from my, my perspective. Should we jump straight into our format? Yeah, I think so. And um, okay. Rita, I guess a question for, um, I guess the first question I'd like to, to put to you is, um, how can businesses help their teams stay engaged and connected, particularly now, I guess, to yeah. start with. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. So this is, um, it's an important one around staying, that, that notion of staying connected um, and, and being connected to our teams being engaged is about 
the platforms that we create as businesses. So, um, you know, and then there's various channels and, and modes that we can use around staying connected, but it's also about keeping a level of stability and normality and a cadence to our work. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, as we go through. So I'm quite happy. It's a smallish group. So if people do want to jump on the chat, I'll, you know, happy for people to be asking questions and things as, as we go through. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll have a look at that and that way we can, Keep, you know, make it a broader conversation too. But in terms of um, that question of helping the team stay engaged, I think the, f the first one, and this is what I'm, I'm hearing from my clients and certainly what I'm advising is um, keep the communication up. In times like this where you feel that, oh, gosh, I don't want to be checking in or imposing or perhaps I'm over-communicating, um, there's probably no risk of that unless you're calling someone every 10 minutes or pinging them on, on any channel every 10 minutes. Um, but really that genuine check-in, I think it's also important. Some people have people that they're living with, some don't. So you've got that isolation aspect and keeping connected, um, but also keeping that communication going helps us retain that sense of belonging, which is so important. We know that's part of human nature. We, we have that um, instinct to belong and be part of that community. So doing that as frequently as you can, as I said, not being a pest, um, but doing that as frequently as frequently as you can obviously keeps your team connected. Just check your, your mode. So what platforms are you using? Um, one thing that has come up recently, and this might be an issue in your workplaces, but we all know about, you know, we're all getting zoomed out and that's, I probably hear that on a daily basis. Um, and I did say to one of my clients recently, let's not, you know, too much um, of something, you know, is never, sometimes is not a good thing. So I find that organisations now in to counteract the fact that we're not seeing each other face to face, we've tended therefore to move every single interaction we have as a video conference. And the thing I'd say to you about that is just, just check whether it's necessary or not. Sometimes, you know, picking up the phone is still adequate and in some cases um, better than having a, a video conference because we know that, and there's plenty of studies already that are coming out around the drain that it puts on us being on a VC all day, every day, and that it takes up a lot more energy because it's, it's virtually looking at a television screen all day, if you like, but you're not getting, um, you're not like, you know, kind of relaxing in, in doing that. You are absolutely on. It takes a lot more energy. So think about your mode of communication. Think about your frequency. You don't have to make every single meeting a, a Zoom meeting or a um, Teams meeting. Going for a walk and talk, I'm hearing clients do, um, is quite effective. Picking up the phone, pinging someone on Slack or whatever channel you're using is still quite effective, but I'd vary the mode too. Um, checking in, I think we've, we've talked about, and that is, you know, as humans, as I said, we like to belong. So make sure you're checking in with people and um, ask your teams, what, you know, and ask your members, your workforce, what do they want? Do they, you know, do they prefer um, a weekly chat, a daily chat? I do more than weekly, but what kind of rhythm do they want to that communication? Third point is around gratitude in terms of, you know, keeping people connected. And I think um, at this time, we know the impact that COVID is having, unfortunately, on a mental health and well-being perspective. And if we can be demonstrating gratitude, and it doesn't mean some of my clients are sending care packs and things, stage one and now stage two or wave two care packs. Some are doing that. You know, you'll work out whether that's a, you know, a, a reasonable and appropriate thing to do from a culture perspective. But even if it's picking up the phone and saying, gee, thanks, you helped me out the other day, or your work on X, Y, and Z has made such a difference. It's demonstrating that gratitude. Again, it helps people feel that sense of belonging. Um, and I do that frequently and also genuinely. Traditions and habits. Uh, when we know that when we're in workforces and teams, there are certain things that we do. You know, it could be Friday night drinks. It might be Thursday lunch together. It could be a morning tea to celebrate birthdays, whatever it might be. I, I encourage organisations to keep those traditions and habits going just because we are home and, and, you know, working from home now, we can still keep connected in that way. But those traditions um, and symbols, if you like, in the workplace help keep people connected. It helps keep the engagement levels up. And again, it helps with that sense of belonging. Psychological safety is another big one. So when we talk about psychological safety from a human resources perspective, it's about people's level of comfort in being able to uh, show up and really talk about, you know, what they like, give an opinion on things, give feedback. Um, it's about creating that 
that safety and knowing that I'm not going to be penalised, I'm not going to be punished, I don't have to be fearful for expressing a view. Um, and not only expressing a view, but maybe expressing feedback or talking to a colleague about something. So that is another way. And I mentioned that point because in a virtual environment, we don't always have the cues, so visible cues, body language, um, and all those other things that come with it to know whether someone's feeling that psychological safety. So it's worthwhile doing a, a almost just a little check for yourself. Do we have in place the right systems and processes to help people feel um, that psychological safety? And then finally, um, it's about focus and it's around helping people keep productive, but also kind of stay on the path with KPIs, what it is that we have to deliver. Yes, they may have adapted and they may change. However, uh, losing focus and momentum on goals is not a good thing either, even though we've had to adapt KPIs and, and things, as I said, may have had to change, but it's always important to just keep people focused and sharp on what they need to do um, because business continues, even though it is in a, in a very different sense. Yeah, thanks, Rita. That's um, some really good points. And I know there's definitely been challenges that we've... Um, We've experienced even just something as simple as being zoomed out, you know, the amount of Zoom teams, meetings, whatever it might be, analysing the detail of people's backgrounds and the back-to-back -back meetings can really take the toll on people. Um, so I guess around productivity and maintaining productivity, do you have any other um, ideas around what um, businesses and business owners can be doing? Yeah. Um, I've had a... a few calls from clients or comments rather recently about uh, I have one actually, which is a really interesting one. So an organization that um, is based here in Melbourne, but unfortunately has a couple of their workforce that are stuck overseas. And so these people, um, one of them is an Australian citizen, but partner is not Australian. So very difficult to come back into Australia right now. One of the employees is not an Australian citizen. So stuck in there, um, they happen to find themselves holidaying uh, at, in February and now find it really hard to come back in. Um, with one of them that's overseas, they're starting to see some performance issues. So this person is based in the UK. They're working to a different timeline to obviously what we are or time zone rather um, here in Australia. But what they're finding is that the performance is starting to slip and it's not just a time time zone issue. There are some other issues at play. And my client said to me, oh, I don't really want to, I don't really want to have the conversation with them. You know, they're going through a lot um, with the partner not being able to get a visa, et cetera. And we talked through that. And my point around that is don't shy away from performance conversations just because we are in um, COVID at the moment and we're working from home. The reason for that is that if we, if we do that, we don't understand how long we're going to be in this for, right? So we're, we're already approaching our fifth month um, here in Victoria of different types of uh, working arrangements. Um, you can't really let some conversations go for that period of time. So think about, the message that you want to provide around managing performance. Um, be sensitive, obviously, to the issues that are at play. So if the person um, is experiencing some personal issues, like in this case where, you know, there's trouble with getting back into Australia, which would cause it a huge amount of stress, be sensitive to those issues, but don't shy away from the performance conversation. I think that that is incredibly important. It goes back to my point around keeping people focused. If we take the foot off the brake when it comes to um, productivity, KPIs, goals, uh, what, what we're here to deliver, then um, I think it adds to the level of stress that already exists in the community. It adds to that level of um, things being, you know, unbalanced, destabilised. So the more certainty we can give people, I think the better that is around maintaining productivity. Um, and the other thing I'd say to that, which, you know, I, I didn't uh, raise in that first question, maintaining a, a, you know, a healthy lifestyle, but also role modelling um, in doing that. So, we know the World Health Organization last year put out a whole bunch of stuff around burnout, how big an issue that is in workplaces around the world. Um, so I, you know, as leaders, business leaders in particular, be very weary of your work practices and that uh, you may not be saying to your team, be available 24 seven, but by virtue of the fact that they see you on, you know, kind of in extended hours, which we're all doing by the way, because we've got kids at home, um, they may feel compelled to do that. So even if you say to your team, look, I'm going to be working odd hours and I, I do this with my clients, you will probably get an email from me at some strange hour because I'm trying to balance work with homeschooling and all sorts of things at the moment. Um, but be rest assured that even if you do get an email at 6am or 11pm, um, I'm on the job that you need. And I think that's important too, but it's around setting those expectations as a leader because remember your staff, you are the culture barometer a lot of the time and they will be looking at you and taking the cue from how you are behaving, what you're doing and what you're saying and all those things. 
So um, in terms of maintaining productivity, just be aware, don't take the foot off the pedal around managing performance, but equally be sensitive um, to the issues that are going on. Yeah, that's a really important part as, as business leaders. Uh, I guess it's up to us to lead the way and um, we're definitely not immune from burnout um, and always need to be energised, especially through the pandemic. And it's, it's a really challenging, uh, you know, period to be going through. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a really good point you raised there. Thanks. In terms of, um, did you have anything else, I guess, that you could perhaps any other points you could share on on that piece on with business leaders and keeping ourselves motivated at all? Or? Yeah, pro probably the last one. It's around, you know, I think, as you said, we're not immune to it. Uh, it's probably a good, uh, the, other, the other thing um, is watching your own emotions. And I often use this analogy with my clients around, you can keep a lid on a boiling pot, um, but the lid is going to want to kind of, you know, um, if any of you have had that um, experience, want to want to jump off depending on what's on the pot. So you can only keep your lid on for so long. And I think just, just be aware of your own emotions, how you're feeling, do all the normal things. I'm not going to be get preachy about exercise and diet and all that kind of stuff. And nor, I'm not an expert in that area other than what I hear others, others say, look, make sure you're looking after yourself. And, and don't get to the point where you're the boiling pot that's going to spill over. Um, manage your own emotions through that and do what you need to do. And, and if you do that for yourself, I think the rest of your team will be encouraged to do that because they see that you're genuine about it and that you're not, you're not just saying it, you're actually doing what, what you're suggesting to them to do. Yeah, thanks, Rita. Really, some really great insights and, um, and, and feedback and, and um, yeah, great advice you've shared there. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. So I'm going to now um, ask you a few questions, George, and in particular around business growth, um, because we know that you, you help a, a number of um, businesses uh, within Darabin, but um, obviously, you know, Jordan and his team being one of them. And what we're really looking for here is um, we're in a time where business growth, it's kind of an ironic term. It might be, you know, for many businesses, it's contracting and there is actually no growth and there's mm. Um, favourite buzzword pivoting and all those kinds of things. Um, and there's a little bit of making hay while the sun shines, I guess, and, and what opportunities businesses can look at in these times. So I, I'm keen um, on behalf of the group to see what your thoughts are. What trends are you presently seeing within local businesses um, during this current lockdown? So in particular, stage four, are you seeing anything different? Yeah, thanks, Rita. I, I guess... Um... I think to really summarise the, the last five months, we really need to look at the beginning uh, of the pandemic to understand what's happening now, but also how things may emerge um, moving forward as well. Certainly, um, you know, what, what we're seeing is across the country, there is this two-speed economy and, and the two-speed economy was, was a term used uh, to describe uh, the mining sector that was operating at a really high functional level and then the rest of the economy, so hence the two-speed economy. I think we've got a COVID equivalent um, where we've got organisations like Coles and a lot of the online um, platforms like Coven.com where they are, um, they're growing um, and, uh, you know, putting extra people on board as well. And certainly, uh, and unfortunately as well, um, the work I'm doing with Mary um, Outreach Support Service, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the um, conversation, uh, based in the city of Durban, um, it's very busy. Um, so the whole homeless sector and, and the funding from DHHS and um, local government and state government, federal government, it's, you know, we, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, we put our best foot forward. So. You know, you've got those organisations and then you've got um, these broader industries around hospitality, travel and tourism. If you look at the banks, not that everyone's going to be disappointed that the banks aren't doing so well, but um, if you're looking at Flight Centre and Virgin, and even if you're looking at, um, you know, local businesses in the city of Durban in those sectors, you know, they're, they're really being impacted. And um, so that's sort of the, the, the broader overview in terms of the economy. But you know, what we saw in the first wave, which is different to the second wave, is the first wave was, um, yeah, businesses made some really fast decisions. And uh, the fast decisions were get people working from home um, and let's just see what we can do to try and understand what this means for us. Uh, 
where do we need to cut costs? Let's make that a point to speak to the bank. Let's speak to our accountants. Uh, but during that time, what I saw was a high degree of innovation as well. So you, you see organisations repurpose their business model to suit the environment. Um, so, for example, you would see, you know, the gin distillery making hand sanitizer, which is great. And then you would see a lot of these um, uh, cafes and restaurants uh, have the pop-up shops, which is good for cash flow, but it's not the kind of cash flow that um, long-term would be, would be great for them. The second wave, unfortunately, it's different. Um, it's going to be a lot slower. It's going to be a lot harder to navigate through this second wave. Now, we don't know, we don't know how long um, you know, stage four uh, and what will happen uh, from where we're at at the moment. But certainly my sense is that um, a lot of businesses need to make um, some tough decisions about their business. And um, so with that in mind, um, there's probably uh, two areas that I would, um, uh, that I'm seeing, but also suggest businesses to look at. And that is try and reduce your line of sight uh, in respect to your business. Um, and what I mean by that is if, if you've got a, uh, if you developed a, a, a 2020, 2021 uh, budget at the beginning of this year, my suggestion is um, sit down and really shorten your line of sight. Um, have a look at only the, uh, this month and the month to come. And by reducing that line of sight it makes it really important around being able to um, try and identify the things that you've got direct control over and trying to influence those as well. Um, but also with that reduced line of sight as well, uh, re really look at um, even revenue targets for the, the business uh, and also for um, if you've got sales individuals in your business as well. My suggestion around that, the numbers uh, in regards to revenue numbers uh, are probably secondary to, to the, my second point, which is um, have that really strong focus on people. Um, and again, this, when we're talking about connecting the workforce, yes, there is a strong IT component. And as uh, Rita um, clearly highlighted around um, the importance of people and culture, what's important around that is um, uh, connectivity and mental health of your workforce. So a lot of organisations that didn't in the past have activated an employee assistance program. And if... You know, and this can apply not just from a growth pers uh, perspective as well, but what that's really important to note is that um, that you want to do that because if you can if you can keep your workforce connected and healthy during this time, where um, where it's really difficult to predict revenue, then you're going to be in a better position when um, things start improving, and they will start improving to be able to, um, you know, capitalise on that. But also on the focus on people as well, I'm going to take a an, um, sort of alternative approach to focusing on your people. And I'd, I'd be encouraging your people to connect with other business owners and people in the city of Derivan as well. It's super important. It, it's great from a social wellbeing perspective, but also mental health perspective but a problem shared is a problem halved. So I really feel strongly that if you're able to connect with other business owners in the city of Derribin, um, and even if you're not in the same sector, just connect and, and say, how are you going? It might be the three or four uh, shops up to your left, and maybe three or four shops up to your right and across the road. That um, sort of captive audience there, you'd be really surprised, um, you know, the level of con connectivity that um, you can build but also how strong as a community you'll be at the end of this as well. Um, so there, that's probably uh, in terms of uh, trends reader. So yeah, it's, it's super important that um, we take a real holistic view around what to do um, and be clear about what we can influence as well. Thanks, George. And I think, um, you know, it is important to make that distinction between here in Victoria, we, you know, some of us are referring to it as an extension of um, that previous wave, but it, this time around, I think it, it does feel different. That's certainly what I'm hearing from different business owners and even, you know, from my own perspective. Um, it's not just a, a matter of, you know, dialing up the resilience a little bit more. It, you know, we know now that 
the longer this thing goes on, the longer, um, you know, it impacts us from a mental health perspective, economic perspective. And so I'm glad you, you made that distinction between um, what you're seeing between the two stages. Um, what are the, the two to three actions that local business owners can do now to support and also protect their business from a sales client servicing perspective? Yeah, any time we talk about um, sales and growth, um, we we need to take the step back and really look at uh, you know the the sum of the parts is what delivers growth for the organisation. So I'm whilst I'm um, uh, spent many many years in sales, for me it was never about um, the end result, i.e., have we hit our numbers. I never lost sleep over that. Um, and it's very difficult to provide that advice now given this current climate. But what I do wanna say is to my earlier point about focusing on the things that you can control is exactly that. Um, so um, look internally within your organization to say, right, what can we control? So the first thing I would be looking at is adapt your business model. Uh, and when I say, um, when I use the term business model, what I'm saying there is try and understand how your business creates, generates, um, and delivers value to your customers and your stakeholders. Mm. And when we think about business model, think about um, the who you target. So who are your customer segments? Secondly, think about um, your core business activity. So that's more focused around the what. Uh, but then also think about your channels to market as well, which is the, the how you connect with your customers. And obviously um, the how you connect with them, then you provide the, the business activities around that. The advice around adapting your business model is um, also the part of your business model is also have a really good understanding of who your external partners are. External partners are um, any partners, if you're looking at a supply chain, that if they are impacted in any way, shape or form, you'll be directly or, indirect, directly or indirectly impacted as well. So my strong suggestion is um, action one would be uh, map out your uh, business critical external partners. And if you haven't already, get really close to them to understand how uh, what's happening in their world? Are there any supply chain issues? Are there, is there the potential where um, supply of important goods and services for you may fall by the wayside because what they're relying on to deliver to them, um, then there will be a break in that supply chain. So really suggest that you do that. Uh, and that is completely within your control to be able to understand um, the broader risks that exist for your business. And um, a close relation to that as well is a sit down and not only from a, um, if, if you're a business owner, my strong suggestion is ask the following question of your peers, your fellow Durban City um, business owners as well, but ask yourself the questions, uh, the question, how can your business be further disrupted? And by asking that question, what you want to, um, the insights that you want to try and generate, are, are there any um, unseen um, risks? Am I uh, unconsciously incompetent? Am I, um, is there something that might come around the corner that I didn't expect? Uh, it, that, that particular point there, I feel leaders are in a better position to not only ask that question, but be able to respond to it better than pre-COVID. And the reason for that is I've certainly seen from a um, sales and growth perspective, there's a lot more adaptability, resilience, and moving fast for business owners. And that is a skill, that is a mindset, a skill set that needs to continue long into the future. Um, and, and that particular mindset will be your insurance policy to make sure that you don't feel, um, you don't feel vulnerable in the way that we did at the beginning of this pandemic, that you need to keep asking yourself these questions about 
let me disrupt my own business. And by doing that, you're going to be better positioned to try and come up with um, answers, not only yourself, but also connecting with your network and also your employees as well. You'll be, um, I found um, from my experience, uh, it's not me that comes up with the, the best ideas. It's always the people around and that collective thinking that, um, you know, grabs a good idea and makes it great. Um, I think the second recommendation is, um, so the first one, which was adaptive business model. Uh, the second one is refocus your customer service or your client servicing. This is important because not, um, uh, there's a couple of principles I live by uh, when, it, when I think about um, sales growth and, and um, customer service. Trusted relationships are everything. And secondly, not all clients are created equally. Um, the first one is uh, important to, um, to really understand the, the depth and breadth of your relationship with your customers. So that's the first point. And that could be just a simple mapping exercise. Um, and I'll get to sort of a, a B2C environment um, in, in a moment, but you know, if you can sit down and map out who your customers are, and then overlay that and say, genuinely, hand on heart, how strong are these relationships? That will give you a pretty good insight on where there may be some work that needs to be done. And, um, and the second one, which is, uh, which is not, not, not all clients are created equally. Um, don't only look at the value of clients based on revenue. Um, really look at um, also strategic importance to your business. Um, think about the potential for growth for those customers. And then deliver a customer servicing strategy during this time that's reflective of how important they are to your business. You can't be all things to all clients. So if you do have limited bandwidth, you've got um, a workforce that is trying to adapt during this time, that's a really good way on how to focus your efforts and make sure that you're, you're putting effort onto your um, best clients. And for, for B2C clients, um, my strong recommendation around this is do use social media to connect with your customers, whether it be Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn. Either way, uh, social media is a quick, efficient way to share your story and connect with your customers and, um, and share your story. People love stories. People like hearing about how you're going uh, and that will build um, a connection whilst um, they're not visibly in front of you, you will build a connection with them as time goes on. And when things are ready to open up and, and you can welcome them through your front um, door, uh, there'll be this sort of uh, invisible connection that you made with them. Um, and certainly they'll be uh, looking forward to you know, coming into your business again. Okay. Thanks, George. I think uh, the, the main thing I took away from that is really that adaptability piece. And I think, you know, once upon a time, we might have had strategies in businesses, you know, we were encouraged three, five, even 10 year strategies. But what I took away from that is really about focusing on more immediate, not necessarily shelving those longer term strategies, but perhaps having something that's more adaptable and, and you know, maybe at the moment, even three months and just looking for those ongoing opportunities. Thanks, that's George. Right. Thank you, Rita. And I, I guess, um, you know, when we are talking about um, risks that present themselves in the business, um, Jordan, um, what I'm keen to understand from you is, you know, what are some of the current cyber risks that you're seeing in the IT security landscape? Yeah, thanks, George. We're, um, look, we're definitely seeing a significant increase. Uh, in 2020, um, phishing attacks, uh, including COVID-19, related scams have increased by over 600%, almost 700%. So a phishing attack for those that may not be aware is when somebody sends an email out to a, a broad range of email addresses and, and with the attempt of obtaining your credentials to your email account to then gain access to your emails and files and so forth. So we're, we're seeing a significant increase. Um, and, you know, I myself last week, we had a fairly large announcement within the business and I started having a lot of emails being targeted at me. So it's really critical that everyone is, is, is you know, is really diligent and the awareness is, is, is so, um, is just critical. I mean, in 2020, again, I, I mentioned earlier on uh, when we were chatting before the call around, there's 
some, something like 1,400 um, domain names that relate to the COVID-19 uh, name that, were, that have been registered in, in Q1 of 2020. So I'm sure it'd be a significant amount more now. And again, you know, how many of those are for legitimate purposes? Well, we don't, we don't really know. But what we do know is that there's, there's three layers of web. You've got your, your normal web that we all would know. You've got your deep web and then you've got your dark web. And the dark web is where the people that are trying to obtain our information and, and do these attacks is where they create these marketplaces. And on the dark web, there's apparently 75% of it is set up as a marketplace and you can easily trade credentials. So somebody could go on there and purchase your, um, your you know, uh, ID, uh, passwords to your email accounts, um, and really um, either look at identity theft as a result of that, they could obtain, um, you know, access to your files. So if you're using, you're using uh, whatever you're using, really, they could gain access to, to, to get into your files and either do what's called ransomware and they could lock down files or they could um, and seek funds from you or they could just really cripple your business. There's people on there that um, offer services to actually go in and hack into a specific business with the sole purpose of impacting that business's ability to trade. So there's a significant number of risks and, and that's compounded by everything we're seeing with COVID. There's so much uh, pressure and fast paced environments and people working from home and there's just so much happening, um, which is just compounding all those risks. Um, and, and that's, yeah, so that's, we're seeing a lot of a massive increase in, in, in cyber attacks. And Jordan, just, uh, just on that point as well, um, you only need to Google cyber risk attack, uh, cyber risk attacks during this COVID period to see that um, it's happening to small, medium and large businesses. So no one's really immune around that. We, we spoke about earlier around that, that quick push at the beginning of um, sort of mid-March um, with stage um, sort of the first wave. Have you identified any risks within the current working from home structures? Yeah, it's a good one because, you know, there's been staff that have been set up to work from home traditionally on the odd occasion, um, but it was always in a lot of businesses looked upon, now we need you in the office to maintain productivity. And then quickly overnight that changed. And all of a sudden we had a huge number of staff in businesses working from home. And that just increases the surface, the landscape of the opportunity that can, that, you know, these cyber criminals can, can use to attack us. So there's one things like, um, if people are using their own personal PCs, what sort of anti, you know, something as simple as what sort of antivirus do they have in place? How are they managing their passwords? Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of gaps from that perspective, but then another gap is something as simple as well, we've got a phone system set up in the office, but now that you're at home, what we'll do, we'll just divert the calls to your mobile phone. The call will go through to your mobile phone and then you'll start calling the client back or the business, whoever it might be. And all of a sudden they've got your mobile phone number. And you might think, oh, it's not a big issue, but as a business owner, if an employee has um, a client calling them on their personal mobile, there's a couple of risks there. One is that wellness piece. You know, you don't want a client calling your, your people at all hours of the night. And that's, that's a challenge that, you know, you're already working long, longer hours, I'd say, whilst working from home. And that is a, it compounded again. But then if that employee was then to leave, then the other risk when we look at IT security isn't just cyber criminals, it's, it's staff as well, because they have the ability to potentially take, uh, well, it's their own phone number, but they don't have all that client contact through their personal phone. So you've, got, you've lost that ability to control your database. So that's a couple of, of, um, of the risks. But then there's also, you know, in the last, um, last 12 months, we've seen the, the amount of ransomware that's being requested by these cyber criminals is up to me like 23%. So it's a, it's a really big, um, big increase. And the, the three things that we look at when we're talking about cybersecurity is, is the three pillars is what we see. There's people, process and technology and all are just as, as equal and, and really important. So you can have great technology in place, whether it be, um, you know, firewalls, whether it be um, dark web monitoring, AV, there's a range of different things that you can put in place, endpoint management. But then you could have um, people that have got a lot of awareness training and, um, you know, simulated phishing attacks and a whole range of things that we can be doing. And then from a process perspective, you'll have great processes. But if one of those falls down, then you're exposed. And we had an example that um, we had 
conducted with a client, uh, I think it was last year, um, and they flew everyone into, into their head office here in Melbourne. And we spent uh, over a day doing you know, training across a range of things, but predominantly security. And about a week later, um, the, the, you know, the processes were set up, there was technology in place. They received an email into their finance department from a, uh, from a, uh, from a supplier that they'd purchased some items from uh, with an invoice for, I think it was around roughly $230,000. The, the, the financial controller that um, needed to then, uh, part of their process was to obtain uh, the sign off, sent it off to the person to obtain that sign off. And the person that was to provide that second level of approval didn't validate the bank details on that invoice. So they went back and said, yeah, we're waiting for that, expecting that invoice approved to pay it. They then went and paid that $230,000 out of their account gone. And what was identified was that their, their supplier's email accounts had been hacked and the invoice, the bank details in the invoice were, were changed. So um, that's a massive risk. So something as simple as that process of just, is the bank detail on the invoice the same as what we've got in our accounting system? And that's a simple check, could have resulted and prevented that from occurring. So that's, that's one thing. We had another scenario where it wasn't a client of ours, but there was a real estate agent and this was a really scary one. Something that, you know, again, we've seen, where um, an email came through and one of their property managers clicked on the email, um, opened it up as they would, didn't really think too much of it, and then quickly identified that it was a ransom attack. Once they opened up that file, it then encrypted all of their files on their servers and locked them out of everything. So they then contacted their uh, IT company at the time and um, said, look, this has happened, we need your help. And you know we've got backup, so back us up what they found out was that those backups hadn't been tested. So it's really important to have backups, but you also need to enact some of those <laughs> continuity plans and testing. So as a result, they didn't have any backups and needed to employ, it was two or three staff for a few months to manually re-enter the data back in. And so they did that. And then um, what they also found was not only did the uh, cyber criminal do the attack and encrypt everything. They also sent out an email to the database of, um, of tenants saying, here are our new bank details, start paying into our new bank account, which obviously wasn't the real estate agent's account, it was the cyber criminal's account. So they were not only spending money and losing money with everything they had to do to react to that, that, that attack, they were also not receiving those rental payments. So that was a big issue. So again, something as simple as a strong continuity plan, uh, from a technology perspective there would have meant that within 20, 30 minutes, they could have been back up and operating and resolved everything. They would have been able to pick everything up. So it's, a, it's the people process and, and technology. And, um, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of alerts, there's a lot of risk, and it's really critical. There's a lot of stories I could share that would probably scare people, but it's, it's an unfortunate thing that that's something we just need to have to, we're going to have to live with and constantly try to be ahead of what these cyber criminals are trying to do. Jordan, you, you've mentioned, look, that's a very scary situation for, for any business. Um, you've mentioned there's some tips there, uh, and we've got the question um, in the chat here around, you know, what are the best practices at the moment, you know, business can do to reduce IT attacks? Um, so, yeah, what are some of the simple ways owners can increase their, their IT security? Yeah, look, definitely. I mean, one is, um, you know, you need someone to have your back. You need to be partnering with a good organization that, that can support you. It's not something that there are things you can do from a small business and I'll share some of those, but um, you need to, I guess, really get a, a security audit done and understand where your gaps are because you can look at adding things in place, but unless you know where all your gaps are, um, you won't really know what you need to add, but some simple things, um, something as simple as multi-factor authentication, um, in your if you're using office 365 or g suite will be a big step in preventing some of those attacks from occurring or being successful um backups one of the things that it's an often a mis misconception is that uh, I've, I've got office 365 with microsoft in the cloud i don't need to back anything up it's in the cloud but if a hacker was to access your credentials they can encrypt all of your emails and lock you out and you won't have access to actually see what's in the emails. What they do is they leave the heading of the email so you know what the email is, but the, the, the body of the email is encrypted. So you know that it's an important email, but you can't actually read it. 
And if you do want to read it, you need to pay them Bitcoin. So having backups in place of your emails, uh, even if you're in a cloud um, perspective, things like um, dark web monitoring, monitoring what's going on, have your details been listed as, uh, as for sale on the dark web. And that's something that, um, you know, does happen and, ha and we see daily of different people's credentials being compromised and then listed for sale. And really one of the most critical ones is there's no doubt that at some point you will be attacked and, and you probably will be compromised at some point as well because our weakest link is our people. And so the most important thing we need to focus on is how do we maintain um, that focus and the awareness with our people. So it's doing constant training, um, security awareness courses. So we, we hold a number of just um, ongoing virtual training that, that staff can do. And we do that internally as well. But we also hold those security sessions um, and, and we will be running some secure, more security webinars specific to the end user and what are some of those things they can do. But that's a big piece is just always being, making sure your people are aware because whilst you might be aware, um, it's really easy for, for somebody in, you know, in the heat of the moment, there's a whole lot of things happening. It's busy and, um, and they just click on something un, unexpectedly and compromise the, the business. Thank you, Jordan. One, one thing that, that I will say is that um, from a, a security audit perspective, we're definitely committed to helping um, local businesses with um, normally one of the services that we would offer is a security audit would normally charge with that just given in the current environment, we're happy to, um, to, to, to share some of those services with businesses and, um, and not charge for that um, in the current times. Um, you know, we've got definitely a couple more weeks of, um, you know, not necessarily being in the office and it's a good opportunity to review some of those gaps. So please reach out and if we can um, help you and give you some, some knowledge that, that you can then take away and either do something with your current IT provider or whoever that might be um, coming back to us, um, we're more than happy to, to help you with that. How do we find that balance in amongst, so we can do a lot of planning around the other things and sometimes the people stuff is harder to plan. Is that, is that the question? Have I got that thread right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I think um, different size organisations will have different plans in place. Some will have very elaborate plans and some won't. And, and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is the level of care and the level, I think, of um, effort that you put in. So it's about being deliberate around it, just like you, you would be deliberate around your IT security plans, your finance plans, all those other things. It's ensuring that in relation to the people aspect of your business, you are as deliberate and planned around that. And so um, that, that's organic because we're not robots at the end of the day. Like you, you have to be uh, adaptable and really have your eye on what is going on and, and be able to tap into not only what you see, what you're hearing and, and that, the thing that's hard at the moment is that we're not together. So you can't, you don't have a feel of the culture because culture at the end of the day is around the feeling, the energy. We don't get a sense of that. And it's very difficult to get that in a virtual setting. And that's why I guess, um, you know, what I talked about, which is that focus on connection because through um, repeated frequent connection, you will get a sense of it. It's not going to be the same, but you will get a sense of it. And, and many teams work, you know, in a, in a global setting remotely. Some, you know, organisations that are global don't hardly interact. They might interact at the annual conference or a couple of times a year, but they are able to do it. So I think it is about being quite deliberate. Um, in terms of the, the, the balance question, I'll, I'll just, this might not have been um, the question, but I'll throw in a couple of comments around that. I think we have to reset our expectations uh, and I say this for myself as much as anybody else at the moment, um, just because we can start work, we literally can get out of bed and start work. And then we can literally turn off the computers and go straight. You know, there's no commute home. It doesn't mean we should. So it's about having in place um, systems and structures that can still mean uh, that you have some discipline around your work practices. So every waking moment is not consumed by work. I'm currently using antivirus in my business, but would like to know what other options for protecting my data um, and how can I feel confident my business is protected from, from a cyber attack. So look, it's great that you're using antivirus and that's definitely an important part. Um, the other options would be definitely looking at um, multi-factor authentication. I'm not sure if you're using Office 365 or G Suite or, or what sort of uh, email platform you're using, but um, multi-factor authentication is really important. And then a backup. So 
what will happen, there's a, there's a shared responsibility that Microsoft and G Suite put in place, which is if their core infrastructure was to, it was to be a fire or it was to flood or there was something that went wrong on their side, they'll, they have that responsibility that they'll protect you. But if there's um, malicious activity from a staff member, if there's a, a hack that occurs, you know, some sort of ransom cloud attack, they won't necessarily protect you. So having a backup in place is really important. And it's not just your emails, it's also your cloud files as well. Um, and also, I know George mentioned around the supply chain um, as one of the, the actions to look at through the current challenge, but um, even outside of COVID, it's probably something that we should be looking at from our suppliers and, and, and the solutions that they're providing us. What are they doing to, to back up the data that they hold that's your data? So often a lot of businesses, whether it be um, a gym, whether it be some, you know, a, a Cairo, whoever it might be, they'll use a various types of cloud platforms. How do you know that your data is backed up? And, you know, and have you asked them the question? Have you confirmed that with them? So um, the two couple of things there would be definitely keep your antivirus. And, you know, again, happy to have a chat. Um, uh, I'll, I'll bring up our details. If you've got any questions, you can reach out and, and contact us. But, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the MFA, the, the backups are really important, but again, happy to have a chat and see, is there anything else within your business that, that's at risk? I'm not sure how many staff you have, but what sort of admin access do they have to those, um, to those machines? Do they have full access? Or do they have limited access, et cetera? There's a range of different things that we can definitely look at um, to help and support um, you, know, you and your business. Even things like where is your data stored? So one of the, you know, from a data sovereignty perspective, so we're required by law to hold data here in Australia, but is that where your cloud storage is? Is it, is it defaulting to Singapore? Is it whereabouts is it? So um, whoever your provider is, making sure that you're clear on that. Is it um, hosted here in Australia is another really important question to ask as well.